this week in MMA, and it's a really, really busy one. We've got a great set of guests and a bit of a late notice Matt change up, one. Matt being one of them, but uh, a legend of not just MMA, bare knuckle boxing, and professional wrestling. We're joined by Phil Baroni. We're also joined by the Body Lock MMA's contributing editor, Michael Fidel. So without further ado, let's get into it. Brought to you by Spretzbox. Head on over to the website spretzbox.com. All you have to do, click to get started. You can either order one of their boxes that has over $100 in value, or maybe you're interested in a single item like these great socks. So click on them, add them to your cart, head on over to the checkout, and then all you have to do is enter in the promo code FNP as follows here. You'll save 10% off your first box or your complete first order. That's spretzbox.com. All right, so we've got a really, really busy weekend of Dude. fights. Tomorrow, we've got UFC Prague. It starts at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific. And there's going to be a fight companion on the Fight Night Picks YouTube channel as well as sportsboot.tv. It's going to be not as good. It's going to be me solo um, for the, the most part of the event. I'll be here at some point, though. Yeah, but it does start uh, fairly early. Matt works till 4 p.m. Atlantic, so he'll jet on over. Um, the main card starts at 3 p.m. Atlantic, so 2 p.m. Eastern, just to give you guys a bit of an idea, but I'm going to go through the entire card. going to be watching it along with you. If you're in the States, you can catch that on ESPN+. Plus. If you're here in Canada, it's going to be a combination of Fight Pass and TSN like we've had recently. It's worked out really well yeah. for us. It's one of the things that I spoke about with Michael in our interview. So I'm going to switch over to this view here. So if you're going to follow along with the Fight Companion, you can find us on Sports Booth. That's kind of what you're going to see when you go over to the website. Um, and if you go there, there's a chat, there's polls, there's also uh, interactive fight cards on the side, so you don't have to go scrambling around if you don't know who's on the main card or who's on the card, you can find it there. It's in real time with our setup here at home um, on OBS, so it works a lot better than what we've been working with uh, if you're on YouTube, because there's usually a 10 to 15 yeah. second delay. So keep that one in mind. And before we go any further, you can find us on social media, myself, at Craig Allen FNP on Twitter and Instagram. Matt at Matt Allen FNP on Twitter. You can find them there. So, like I said, UFC Prague. Um, it's a great card starting kind of the middle of the day here in North America. There's also one other card tomorrow that's of note. You've got Bellator 217. It's a numbered event. It's not really, it is and it's not a part of their European series, which kind of surprised me because it's a little bit of a lesser card. I it threw is. It's not great. I threw it a poll on the Bellator MMA News uh, Facebook group. A lot of people are kind of thinking the C to B range. There are a few A's, which kind of surprised me, but uh, the majority don't really see it as being a great card. There is some good uh, local Irish and, and UK talent on there, um, and we'll go through that a little bit more. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a half-decent card. You can catch that. Um, 5 p.m. GMT. It's on, uh, I believe the main card starts at 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, around there, 3 or 4 p.m. Eastern. So you can catch that. Um, Bellator website, you can catch it also on their app. Um, so that's what's going on with Bellator. Now, I had said it, I teased it quite a bit. We've got two really, really great interviews today. Got a phone interview with the New York badass himself, Phil Baroni. Caused a bit of a storm this week with Jared Gordon on Twitter. I did, did see that. Um, he's got a lot going on in 2019. He came back in 2018, uh, got a win in MMA, 24 second knockout, fought in uh, bare knuckle this past year, had the loss to Chris Lieben. We touch on that. A uh, bit of an uncomfortable subject with him, but not just him, every fighter exactly. on that WBKFF card. So we talked about that um, a bit. And uh, as well, he's into professional wrestling too. And I was actually really surprised of all the names he started to list off and how he got into it. It's a, it's a pretty cool story. So that's what we'll get into right now. Let's hear from Phil Brony himself. So joined by the New York badass Phil Brony. A lot of people would uh, recognize you from your stint. You had you fought in the UFC, fought with Pride, um, and quite a few different other fighting organizations. Phil really wanted to, uh, to thank you for coming on the show. And uh, yeah, man, let's get uh, right into it. So... Early on in your MMA career, you joined the UFC. It was your second MMA fight. Like, how did that come about for you? Man, I had a reputation as, as an ass kicker. And uh, I, I was always trying to get in the UFC an undefeated boxing and kickboxing uh, record. And uh, I was a college two-time All-American. So uh, my, my manager at the time was uh, Joe Gold, owned uh, one of the only magazines. 
magazine, the biggest magazine at the time, Full Contact Fighter, knew the promoter, who, which was Peretti, was John Peretti, he got me hooked in, and right before, right before the event was to take place, they sold the UFC to uh, Dana White, and uh, UFC 30 was the first show they put on, but I was actually, I was actually like an acquired, acquired fighter from the, from the old school, from John Peretti. Okay, yes sir, and you had a couple of different, uh, you know, opportunities with UFC. Uh, for me personally, I know the fight against Dave Mene. That's one that a lot of people really recognize. Um, definitely one of those highlight reel wins. So for you, you you took a bit of a layoff from 2014 until this year. What made you come back to MMA? Fuck it, body feels good. Uh, fun, man. I miss it. Something to do. I feel good. I can do it right now. You know. One day I'm gonna wake up and I can, and uh, then I can. So I feel pretty good right now. I got into pro wrestling, and I was doing that for fun. I was kind of retired from MMA, and uh, I just felt really good doing that. I went did some jujitsu with a couple of guys, and uh, just feel really good. I'm just having fun, you know. I'm just I'm just having a good time. If I can, why not? I would like. It. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, 24 second uh, knockout win there against Matt Lagler back in May. Um, do you have any plans of fighting in MMA in 2019? I'm, I'm looking for, you know, I'm looking for the opportunity. Okay, for sure. I'm just looking for, just looking for the opportunity right now, yeah. And I know, and this is a bit of a, a touchy subject, I know, but this year you had the chance to fight with WBKFF in the main event against Chris Lieben. Um, I know the fight definitely it didn't go your way. How did you get involved? <laughs> How did you? <laughs> how did you get involved with the organization from the get go? Some fucking bullshit, man. I, I, I was supposed to uh, be fighting for the, uh, the organization that's still in uh, still in existence right now. It's still putting on shows. They just did a, a good show in uh, Mexico. Uh, I was supposed to fight for that, but this this, this show had a ridiculous offer, you know, and, 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 and a tougher fight. And I was like, fuck it, man. It was, it, was, it was a lot of money. It was bullshit. There was no money, and it was, uh, you know, the weight class, different weight class, but whatever. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I feel for you and and all the other fighters that took place. I know um, the the event didn't go all, all as planned, anyway. Yeah, yeah, I just did it for money. You know, I think I think a lot of guys just did it for money. It's a lot, it's a lot of money to get a, a one shot. Exactly. You know, a ball, a ball. And to to be you know specific, it was it was WBKFF that you fought for BKFC. They're still holding events. Is there any chance that you go and fight for BKFC? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm looking. I'm, I'm, I'm looking to go fight there. I'd like to go fight Tommy Gunn. Uh, Bobby Gunn, you know, I'm Bobby Gunn. I've been fucking uh, Tommy Gunn. I've been fucking. Uh, no, I'm a fan of the guy. The guy's a great fighter. He's a champion, and uh, there's only one way to redeem myself, and I'll be to. Uh, fight the best fighter and that would be uh that would that would be bobby gunner yeah i mean bobby's a legend of the sport with uh with bare knuckle boxing too that'd be a great fight for sure so looking forward to more mma fights in 2019 some more bare knuckle boxing fights but another thing that you're really passionate about and i know you got into here somewhat recently Mm -hmm. um can you kind of touch on the professional wrestling how did you get into that i I was always in the professional wrestling that's nobody knows why my my, uh (laughs) My uh, my, my great great uncle was uh was Captain Little Battles, so, it was, so it's, a, it's a family thing, and I've always been going to wrestling since I was a little kid. I I've been uh, I've seen uh, I've been that to the uh, Jimmy Superfly Snooker. I watched him jump off the cage and miss Bob back when I was a little kid. That's the first pro wrestling memory I, I still have when I was when growing up. But I've always been the pro wrestling. I mean, even when I went to college, I, I was going out training with Dan. Uh, and to be separate when he was over in uh, when he was over in Michigan, he was where my university was, and I was training with him, and I was getting ready for the uh, I was getting ready for the WWE. And he basically said, "Man, there's a opportunity to be in, in, in the UFC," and he, and he was friends with uh, Joel Gold, a full contact fighter, and, and, and uh, I went that route instead. But yeah, I was told WWE back all the way back then. Yeah, I mean that's awesome to hear. And I saw from uh, from Twitter you've got um, you know an event coming up with Josh Burnett's Bloodsport. Um, when is that? And and do you have any details on it? Do I have any details on it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. Uh, hold on, I've all the details <laughs> right here. Let me find this way. Blah blah. It's, uh, fuck. It's, it's Blood Sport. Thursday, April 4th, 2000. Hold on a minute. <laughs> Thursday night, April 4th. 
don't know. <laughs> Sounds good. No, Phil, um, one more thing that I wanted to touch on, and this goes back quite a bit, and it's one of those things that when, when I think of Phil Brony and a lot of people think of Phil Brony, some people might not, but way back in the Pride days, um, you had Mark Coleman taking on Shogun Hua, and after the fight, there was a bit of controversy, and you and Vanderlei Silva went at it a little bit um, in the melee. Did you ever, like, reach out to Vanderlei Silva? Did you guys ever bury the hatchet? Or, or you know, did, did tensions ever settle after that? Oh, yeah, well, you know, whatever, man. It was, it was, <laughs> I mean, we, we buried the hatchet, you know, we buried the hatchet. But I, I would definitely love to fight him. You know, I would definitely, I'd definitely love to fight him. Like, that, would be a, that would be a fun fight in, uh, in Japan. Yeah, that'd be awesome for sure. I, I think it rises, you know, down the line yeah 100 percent. it'd be a great fight for sure and phil i really wanted to thank you for joining me man thanks for giving us the time and uh man really looking forward to to 2019 whether it's mma bare knuckle boxing and with the professional wrestling as well so for the fans out there where can they find you online on social media and if you've got any sponsors to shout out let us know man ask for on twitter Find me at Twitter. Check out my clothing brand, Future Legends. Future Awesome, Phil. Well, thanks so much for joining me, and good luck with 2019. Great interview with the man, the New York badass, Phil Baroni. I mean, it, it, it's it's crazy to think that you know he took some time off. His last MMA fight was 2014. He came back in 2018. He was super active. Yeah. Make sure you go follow him, man. He's he's a riot on Twitter. So I mean, he's he's interesting <laughs> at, to say the least. At Phil Brony on Twitter, at Phil Brony underscore N Y B A. Don't on check Instagram. it on your work Wi Fi. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> it's not safe for work, but yeah, Phil Brony, awesome, and can't thank him enough for coming he's back, a character. Uh, coming on the show. So. Let's get into it with Michael Fidel. Michael, if you followed along with Fight Night Picks, he's been on the geez, been on the YouTube show, the podcast when it was a podcast. He was on uh, my dialogue shows friend too. Of the show. Friend of the true friend of the show. We go hard in the paint on UFC Prague as well as Bellator 217. And Michael's a big, big jiu-jitsu fan, so we get into combat jiu-jitsu a bit. So let's get into the interview with Michael Fidel. Joining me once again, and it's been quite a while since we've worked together, Michael Fidel. Now, Michael A. First thing, uh, new title. So can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm officially with the Body Lock. I joined um, exclusive there, and I bumped up to uh, contributing editors. So essentially, I'm going to be doing the straight news pieces, the interviews, uh, in-depth profiles, but I'm also going to be writing uh, more column-focused pieces. So taking a situation that's un- uh, developing an MMA and writing a column on it, an opinion piece, um, and with uh, the next generation of me, uh, the people who are just getting into writing and trying to hone their craft while also learning how to do it in a sphere like MMA. So hopefully being able to uh, impart the lessons that I've been taught onto uh, anyone else who's starting. And you've got a really good advantage. I mean, youth, A, but B, I mean, your boot's on the ground in Florida. So you've got all the opportunity in the world to go to some of the different gyms. I mean, some of those pieces that you're looking on, uh, on working on. It's going to be great for you, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. The Body Lock does great work for sure. Um, Jake and the gang, you guys really have it together, so congrats, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. We have a really busy schedule, not just, I mean, go back a week or two, but from the start of this year, headed into, and we're almost done February, it's hard to believe, um, into the spring, you know, uh, Bellator just booked their May 11th date, um, all sorts of great fights there. We've had a fighter leave MMA today, and it was one of the fighters that kind of got me into the game with George St. Pierre. And I know you sent out a couple of tweets in the last couple of days on it. Um, you, from what I understand, the only fight you got to see live was uh, St. Pierre and Bisping. But yep. to you, I mean, what does George St. Pierre mean to you? Well, yeah, like you said, I came into MMA late, uh, end of 2015, so I didn't get to experience George St. Pierre the same way uh, so many people before me did. Um, but what I can say is that George St. Pierre, to me, is the model of class. He's the model of um, doing things the right way. Uh, I believe it was Luke Thomas or Patrick Wyman put out a tweet where they said, essentially, everything that George St. Pierre did, 
while it's impossible to be perfect, was about as close to perfect as you can get. And I think that really speaks volumes about the type of career he's had. I don't think there's anyone in the sport, save for maybe an opponent who he's riled up, who might say uh, that George St. Pierre is anything less than a perfect sportsman and a perfect competitor. The guy is the epitome of class. He's the epitome of what we expect from an MMA fighter. And I think really the sport is better for having him and uh, worse off for losing him. Yeah, I mean, I can't agree with you more. And I talked about it. I think I talked about it a little bit on Twitter. I might have mentioned it on a um, show I was on recently. But that's how I get into it. The Under Armour, the GSP shirt. I mean, that's how I get into MMA. I started in... I, and we talked about this on the shows that I had on Dialogue. We talked about this quite a bit. But I get into it like 2008 to 2010. And for me, it was watching the GSP pay-per-views. I didn't... Again, I was very, very casual. I was quite young, too. And it was just about watching George St. Pierre fight whoever it was, you know, always rooting for St. Pierre. And then John Jones. It was always John Jones pay-per-views. So those two really got me into the sport. I left, but I was always, you know, following George St. Pierre. And it was at the time, it was hard to go around to bars or up here, um, Boston Pizza is a really, really popular chain restaurant. So you go into a Boston Pizza, sometimes they show the fights, but they'd have posters. Uh, Dooley's was a big spot here in Fredericton. St. Pierre was everywhere, man. You couldn't you couldn't get away from it. I mean, commercials. Everything was George St. Pierre. So it's definitely a loss for, for not just the MMA community and how great of a guy he is, but for, for the Canadian scene too. I mean, he really did a lot. And I, we've got a card coming up, and I believe it's, it's early May as well, um, targeted for Ottawa. And there's a lot of great Canadian fighters on there. No doubt some of them uh, directly influenced by George St. Pierre. I mean, you look at Elias Theodoru training um, with TriStar. He, he would be one of those guys. But just a, a great guy for the sport. And it's kind of weird because it seems like he's kind of leaving the door open, possibly, that he could come back if, if circumstances kind of permitted him to. Well, yeah, if he does come back, there are a ton of things on the table. Um, I posted a tweet that got well over 200 and I think 10 now <laughs> responses of people varying degrees of politeness saying yes or no. But it was whether you would prefer GSP Habib or uh, Habib versus Tony. And I think the the volume of yeses on that post, I was kind of surprised by because I, I, I'm on Twitter often. I see that Habib Tony is the fight that people want. But everyone's going for GSP, too. Yeah. So it shows what kind of a draw he is. And before we move too far, Twitter's been weird the last week or so. Because since it's come out that there's a, a pretty good possibility that Tony Ferguson's going to fight Max Holloway, everybody seems to hate that fight from what I've seen. I think it's it's a fun fight. I think it's kind of a shame that Dustin Poirier kind of seems to be on the bit of a back burner, uh, calling for his release, same as Aya Quinta. Which, you know, I disagree with Iaquinta, but for Poirier, he's been up there fighting the top of the top. Tony Ferguson's a guy, interim champ, he never lost, so he really does deserve a shot. But I think a Tony Ferguson and Max Holloway fight is super, super competitive. It's a good one for Max to move up. I mean, geez, they even kind of look the same with the back tattoo, so I think it'd be a cool fight. But yeah, fans seem to be varying degrees of... Do they want GSP to fight Khabib? Who does Khabib fight next? Who does Tony fight next? It's a weird landscape right now in the UFC. Yeah, it really is, and it's a shame because that division is one of the best divisions in the UFC and in MMA, period. I mean, you have so many guys at the top who put on exciting fights, so many guys at the top who have earned their uh, quote-unquote shot. And it, it's very odd because it really comes down to the UFC's subjective discretion. So we're going to see how things play out, but um, it, it's really it's really jumbled up at the top there. It's really jumbled up, and if we do move on a little bit, now we're still looking back, but moving on to last weekend, you had UFC on ESPN. How was that received down in the States? Because I get a totally different perspective up here. So I actually watched with a group of friends who are not MMA fans. They don't watch <laughs> it. Uh, they might know, oh, Con the Connor guy's fighting. He's from, what, England? So that's what I was dealing with. But uh, they liked it a lot. I mean, one of the fights that we had just turned on the main card for, it was a bit of a hassle because they're, oh, let's go outside. And me saying, oh, no, let's watch the fight. So we had to deal with that. But uh, the fight that we actually turned on was Luque uh, versus Barbarena. So that immediately won me some credit, won me some clout there with my friends because that's one of the best fights I've ever seen. 
Uh, that was unbelievable. So that was a good way to segue in. And then, of course, um, down the line with the Nganu Velasquez fight, that was something that generated a bunch of heated arguments. Existed uh, a couple hours pre- prior. So uh, that was a fun event. But it seems like everyone loves it down here. I have a small sample size. I can't really speak to the state. But uh, from everyone I've talked to, the UFC being on ESPN has opened their eyes to the sport and made it more accessible. And, of course, the fights deliver. And when they do deliver, uh, it makes new fans. I mean, it seems like a good deal, and they're really, really yeah. pushing it. I mean, it seems like there's a lot of ads down there. Up here, it's business as usual. It's on TSN, your ESPN equivalent. So nothing's really changed. And if anything, it's been a little bit better. We still do have uh, fights on Fight Pass, which I can get behind because typically the pacing's a lot better. And, and as far as the show is concerned, it's pretty good on there. So I've got mm. uh, no hang-ups. You had mentioned, I mean, the Luke Barbarina fight, possible fight of the year. It's early. We're there. I've got two fights that I want to focus on. We'll go with one first, then we'll go with the main event. So the Gracie Caceres fight, and you and I talked about this earlier on tonight. Um, a lot of people really singing the praises of Gracie. I think he definitely, he, if he's going to compete at this elite level, and we already know what to expect with him, but man, the guy is not a great interview. I mean, he's just not. Like, it was kind of a weird interview after the fight. Some of the interviews I've watched with him before, the whole flat earth conspiracy, like things are kind of going, it's it's a bit of a weird start for him, but he spoke with his results. He did get outstruck, even though that doesn't really matter. He got outstruck four to two. Um, and you and I talked about it. His striking looked kind of wonky to me. And I know he's a jujitsu practitioner and a super specialist, but he landed one nice left hook he threw another flurry where I think he threw like three hooks in a row. None of them really seemed to land. And then once he got in close with Caceres, he got the body lock and finally to the ground. We know what happened. I mean, were you were you overly impressed by his performance? And I know that's a George St. Pierre quote right there. But were you really impressed by his performance? And if so, who's a good matchup at 145? So to answer that question, yes and no. Um, I wrote a piece talking about what you need to know about Crone Gracie going, or Crone rather, uh, going into the event because I figured a lot of people might just see the Gracie name and assume, oh, he's a Gracie, so he's in. That's all I need to know. But doing that, it allowed me to rewatch his tape from his previous fights. And watching the Tokoro fight, watching the Kawajiri fight, you start to see a pattern which often develops among uh, jiu-jitsu guys who move to MMA is that they start off very willing to strike and to test out their newfound skills. And then once they realize that uh, better trained counterpart, uh, in this case, Caceres, um, you kind of deal with the fact where, oh, my striking isn't my grappling, so let's close distance. And when Gracie's able to do that, he's very good. Like you said, he got the body lock. Uh, in the Kawajiri fight especially, his clinch striking was uh, very good, yeah. very impressive actually. Um, so if he's able to close distance, he can do well. The thing that I thought – going into the Caceres fight, that might be an issue, was obviously Caceres is an extremely long fighter at that weight class. Very tall, very long, and he likes to keep people on the end of his strikes. So if he could have done that, he could have stopped Gracie. But no matter how clunky and wonky Gracie's striking was, which I completely agree it was, it almost worked in a sense because it forced him to kind of be more wild, which led to him charging more, which led to him being able to get the clinch that he's so desperately, or rather so... um, importantly prioritized so i think that definitely he needs to improve the striking but that'll come with time i mean dominic cruz likened him a lot to damian maya um and then i heard the name brought up one of my favorite fighters to watch and i think it was more because it was um the fact that he fought recently but ronnie yaya so they mentioned yaya there and you'll see him he throws hooks 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 and then he kind of gets in and charges so that's what we saw to crone the other thing was the leg kick. I think he might have thrown, I know he threw one for sure. He might have thrown two, but the one that I did see, it was really, really weird. It didn't look like it accomplished anything. So yeah, I think in future, they're going to give him another kind of middle of the road type of guy. I know a lot of people want to see Ryan Hall. I think that's too dangerous of, of, of a fight. What do you think about that? The I'd love to see it. But as an MMA fan, I'm not sure if that's too much too soon. Ryan Hawk kicked the face off of Gray Maynard over the course of three rounds, and that's a much more experienced striker than Crone Gracie is. So I'm not sure if Ryan Hall represents the best matchup because Ryan Hall might just 
decide, well, this, the only way this guy's going to beat me is on the ground, and we know Ryan Hall's a very cerebral fighter. He might decide to keep it standing instead, which might not work out too well for Gracie. But from a jiu-jitsu perspective, please book that fight. I think it'd be fun. It's just you. Do, I don't want an L in the column for Gracie, so I think that's that's too tough of a matchup. I think another striker might make some sense, but a Ryan Hall fight would be fun, and I I would ultimately get behind it. But if we move up the card, we look at the main event. You had Ngannou taking on Velasquez. Velasquez a long layoff, and Ngannou coming off a big win over Blades. So really, it was you know chicken or the egg. Was it the uppercut or was it the knee that buckled? What do you think about that? I think it was the uppercut first and the knee second, and uh, I had a similar argument with my friends on that uh, on that count. Uh, they're big Kane fans, as am I, um, but I felt upon watching the replay, it's very clear that Ngannou lands almost a shovel hook, like a 45-degree angle uppercut, which stuns Kane as he's coming in. And I think it was just a momentary lapse of consciousness where he drops, and we see so many fighters get dropped and immediately pop back up. But when Velasquez fell... Obviously, he's very injury prone. The knee wasn't there for him. He's climbing up in age. And I th think that uh, the uppercut dropped him, but the knee gave out as a result of that. Yeah, and I think that's what happened. I mean, if you look at it, it was a short uppercut, really, that kind of dropped him. And then after that, all Ngannou had to do was continue to strike. And he is one of those fighters that has that type of instinct to continue to finish the fight until the referee jumps in. And a point that was made by Javier Mendez, I disagree with this personally, but he said on Submission Radio, uh, Kane came in to shoot. He got hit in the back of the head. An illegal shot that dazed him a little bit when he went in for the takedown. And that's what kind of jacked up his knee to start. Now, I saw it as he went in for the takedown and Ganu lifted him up. There was a point where Ganu threw a bit of a hand. And it was, it was more of like a hammer fist. And it caught him in the back of the head, neck area. But, I mean, that's to the referee's discretion. And the referee mm -hmm. was clearly fine with it. To me, it didn't bother me. I'm of that school where if it's fine by the referee, it's fine by me. Um, do you agree with Mendez on that one? I'd have to re-watch because I'm not sure I necessarily remember the exact strike. But with the way that you've described it, uh, unless Ngannou's knee buckled as a result of that strike, I have a hard time going with that theory because the uppercut uh, was a more immediate cause of the knee buckling. So while it very well might have happened... Uh, I definitely am in your camp with the, if the referee doesn't call it, you keep fighting. That's the rules of the game. Uh, like it or leave it. Um, but I do think that that theory kind of loses water when the uppercut is introduced as a more direct cause for the knee. And I think if it was a really, really big deal, it would have been something that they said in the fighters meeting where if it happened in the fight, the referee would automatically hop in. You see that Every now and again with fence grabs and different illegal moves, you'll see a referee. I saw it recently on a local show. It was a quick tap of the fingers in the cage, and a point was deducted. And I, I could hardly even believe it. I mean, it's something you don't see very often. But, um, yeah, if, if the referee airs that it's not an illegal strike, that's fine by me. And I'm sure it's fine by a lot of people that were watching that fight. And, and you're right. It was a really quick one, too. You'd have to go back, watch in slow motion. It was kind of hard to catch there. But... We'll move forward. I think it was a decent weekend of fights. I mean, you had the two Bellators that were a little underwhelming. UFC, I thought, really delivered. Um, and I want to move into something that I know you're really excited about. So you're a big combat jiu-jitsu guy. You're a big jiu-jitsu tournament guy. We've got some news, um, some bad news. We've got some good news. Which one do you want to go with first? Let's go with the good news. Let's go with good news first. So a tweet by Chael Sonnen. What couple wants a crack at Austin and PVZ in a tag team match at Boss Lady MMA um, as far as submission grappling is concerned? A, Chael Sonnen bringing back the, the submission grappling tournaments. That's got to be good for you. And B, I mean, what's going on here? I, have we ever seen a tag team uh, male and female jiu-jitsu competition like in, in the limelight before? Uh, I'm not sure if we can say that we've seen it in the limelight, but we have seen tag team grappling in uh, SUG before Submission Underground. Uh, yeah, the Body Lock, we posted a report that Submission Underground was returning in 2019 about last week. And it was something that I was super excited about because it's one of the best grappling events around. Uh, you've got a ton of grappling promotions to choose from if you're a fan or even if you're not a fan. There's still a bunch of them out there. So there are. I'm sorry. But Submission Underground is great because Chael Sonnen, obviously, he's got a flair for the dramatic. He likes to push, push the envelope as to what's going to be allowed. So he uses an EBI-style 
um, of submission only no gi grappling. So that's guaranteed to push the pace. But he also does a lot of things like that where um, there are fun guys who are competing like John Jones, Dan Henderson, or crazy things like tag team grappling. He experimented with it uh, last year on the final show of SOG for the year and up until this point now with the tweet, uh, which was uh, – Submission Underground 7, and there was a tag team match there, and I was actually watching. It was crazy. I, I mean, someone's in a bad position, and they wall walk over to their teammate, touch the teammate, and the teammate gets in wherever they are. So the teammate can essentially jump on a guy's back if he's sitting in mount on his teammate. I don't know if I explained that well, but someone's mounted, and they are able to tag their teammate. The teammate jumps in. They don't take the place. They just immediately are in, um, which is fascinating to me. And now with Sonnen's tweet, um, Vanderfer, Vanderford and uh, Van Zant. That's a co-ed couple. They're very high profile. Vanderford, undefeated prospect in Bellator. Paige Van Zant, obviously a women's MMA star in the UFC. That's going to be awesome. Um, I have an article coming out on the body lock. Hopefully it's 7.58 soon. Um, <laughs> but that'll be talking about um, some possible people who could step in there. Uh, the De La Rosas, who are a married couple in the UFC, Misha Tate and Johnny Nunez, who just had a child. Uh, Misha Tate, obviously, UFC champion. Johnny Nunez, two-season Ultimate Fighter veteran. Um, maybe Gilbert Melendez and Carrie Ann Melendez want to step in. Gilbert, obviously, a legend in the sport. Those are just three off the couples that could step in, and I think that would be amazing to watch. I think what Chael Sonnen does with Submission Underground is pretty cool. I mean, like you said, the the name in my mind was John Jones. So if you've got names like yeah. that competing, you've got uh, mixed tag teams going together. I think it's great for the sport. And if you're trying to sell the sport, that coupled with the combat jiu-jitsu that a lot of people are really getting intrigued by. I mean, maybe it's not something, myself included, uh, I'm not the type that's going to sit down and watch a whole lot of jiu-jitsu tournaments. It's just not totally for me. I can understand it. I know you mm -hmm. love it. But for me, it's not the biggest thing in the world. But I think with combat jiu-jitsu and when you can bring in some different flair, like you had said, I think it's definitely good for the sport. One thing that's not good for the sport, Gordon Ryan out six months, and he's a guy that's looking to make his MMA debut sometime soon. I know I had talked with Gary Tonin. You had talked with Gary Tonin, kind of asking him, when are we going to see Gordon Ryan? He wouldn't really put a timetable on. And then Gordon Ryan went on um, the MMA hour with Luke Thomas, kind of touched on it a little bit. We were kind of hoping maybe this year, maybe early next year. Now it seems like that's kind of going to be delayed a little bit. Yeah, it's definitely going to be delayed. Um, you and I, as you said, have both spoken with Gary Tonin. And to me, he said that it was going to be about a year until uh, – Gordon Ryan made the switch. Uh, I know Gordon hinted at that on the MMA Hour as well, which I, I thought that was going to be an announcement of him signing with a promotion. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I was a little bit let down, but great interview as always. Um, but yeah, this is going to push him back a little bit. It's six months, but uh, I've been scrolling through his Instagram because I, I do that. <laughs> and apparently he's approaching it very well. He's saying that there's no way that he's going to come back and be a worse grappler than he was before. He's going to take this time off of the mats to really study the finer aspects and the technical aspects of the game going into the blue basement with the Danaher team and the Hensel Gracie team and studying positions studying moves living vicariously through his teammates and really stepping up his game which to me is something that is terrifying for any other grappler and eventually for the MMA world it's like when John Jones posts that he's working on his boxing in the garage and everyone else takes a kind of deep breath and goes oh no, we're screwed. That's what I think of when I think of Gordon Ryan sitting there and really putting his mind to all the technical details uh, in jiu-jitsu. But yeah, it's a bummer that he's hurt, but uh, I'm looking forward to his return and his eventual MMA debut. Yeah, I mean, I can't wait for it. We've seen grappling uh, you know, submission artists find major success into their, what, mid to late 40s in the UFC heavyweight yeah. division with Olenek, um, even lately. So, I mean, Gordon Ryan, if he's able to make a successful transition... Whether it's in UFC, Bellator, one, I, the, every organization is going to line up to sign him. Even KSW. Yep. And I mean, we're not going to even cover, we're not even going to touch KSW, you and I. But um, yeah. KSW yeah. 47 is loaded coming up. And there's oh, all yeah. sorts of great heavyweights. So um, wish nothing but the best for Gordon. And uh, hopefully it's a speedy recovery. So what we will touch on, we've got two cards this weekend. 
One of them, nobody's thinking about it. One of them, they are. Um, let's start with the one that nobody's really touching on. Bellator 217, you've got James Gallagher making his return, taking on Stephen Graham, who, honest to goodness, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are thinking, Stephen Graham, if you look at the post right now, maybe he's Irish too. He's not. He's American. He's 6-3. and three. Um, I ask that question a lot. I'm, I'm going to ask it, but you don't have to even answer this. Letter grade on this card. Um, is it... Above a C? C. And I'm a to the extent that you do, or obviously the people who are fight fans in Europe would. So for me, this is going to be a C plus in that I'm watching. I'm going to pay attention. I'm sure that it will be a great event, but there's nothing that's really draw, catching my eye or drawing me to make this a must-see event with the exception of maybe Gallagher. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think this is a great way for Bellator to continue expanding in Europe. So uh, I'll give them credit for that, but I, I can't give it anything higher than that um, as a, in this sense, a casual fan. I'll go through a few of the fights that I'm looking forward to. Um, on Saturday, I'm going to be doing a fight companion for the Prague card, not for Bellator. And the way that it's structured, UFC on ESPN uh, Plus, it starts at 11 a.m. Eastern. See, I have to think of it in terms of the states. I'm in Atlantic time zone on TSN. I got to think of it in Eastern time zone on ESPN. So um, 11 a.m. Eastern, that's when you can catch the Prague card. Um, but Bellator starts later. Um, main card starts at 4 p.m. Eastern. So if you're in Ireland, it's it's a lot later. Um, 9 p.m. Uh, GMT. Fights I'm looking forward to. Sinead Kavanaugh was supposed to be taking on Olga Rubin. I was looking forward to that fight. Kavanaugh out. In steps in. Ioni. Raza Fjarsson, and she's six and one. Ruben's five and zero. Oh. Um, in Ruben's last fight, she beat Cindy Dandwa, which is a really big win for her. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to that fight, and especially on short notice. I think that's going to be a good one. Alfie Davis is also stepping in on short notice. He's a guy that fought in KSW in his last fight. He's ten and three. Um, and one other big one that's kind of on the prelims. I know you got Kiefer Crosby at five and zero, oh, but Will Flurry taking on Sean Taylor. Flurry's four and zero. Oh. He had a really really good amateur career too. He fought in EFC. His last fight was his first one with Bellator. He lost. I picked him to win. I was really excited for that one. Um, but he was what uh, seven and zero oh as an amateur. He was four and zero. Oh, now he's four and one. Trains at SBG. So I'm looking forward to that one. Irish Charlie Ward's on this card. Somehow on the main card at 5-3, and three, a guy who most people remember from his time in the UFC when he got slammed uh, and knocked himself out against Glory Buffondo. And he also fought in that uh, card, what was it, Bellator 187, when Conor McGregor jumped into the cage, pushed Mark Goddard. So most people remember Charlie Ward for that and his blackout arm tattoo. Um, you've also got Richie Smolin, who was on season yep. 27 of The Ultimate Fighter, who I saw in Moncton. He was here um, with uh, Artem Lobov. And uh, he's just a mean-looking guy, just a mean-looking smaller fella. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to his fight there. Peter Quelly, Miles Price, they don't like each other. That should be good. James Gallagher, I posted something on Reddit, and people on Reddit really, really don't like James Gallagher, and the people of Twitter don't seem to like him a whole lot either. I think he's still a great talent, man. I mean, the Bandejas loss took a lot of the wind out of his sails, but he was right back doing interviews right after that, basically congratulating Bandejas and saying that he has to grow in his game. So it should be a half decent fight. Yeah, I mean that I, people are naturally going to dislike you if you have that kind of <laughs> confidence and bravado. And I think Bandejas uh, really took over a lot of those people and did what they wanted. But I mean, you can't fault Gallagher. He's trying to sell himself, sell the fight. Obviously, fighters have to have that kind of self-confidence to get into a cage with another human being uh, and get their hand raised. So you can't fault him there. He's just trying to sell his fights. Um, but Gallagher is an incredible talent. If you take away the bravado, if you take away the confidence, if you take away their so-called arrogance, you're left with an incredible prospect. Very young, very talented, great grappler. So hopefully he's able to rebound because I think uh, Bellator and the division are better with him winning. Um, I would love to see a Bendejas rematch down the line if things line up that way. Obviously not soon, but down the line when t they're both well into their careers um, at their primes, I think that'd be great. And uh, I think he could be Bellator's big star in Ireland or Europe, uh, mirroring kind of like a McKee or a Pico here in the U.S. So I think it's great for uh, Gallagher if he can get the win, uh, great for Bellator if he can too. And people that really want to you know, talk poorly of Gallagher. He had a fight booked with Adam Borch, and that was that would have been a really, really good fight. 
He also yeah. has that win over Chinzo Machida, and that's that's a pretty telling win. I mean, it's not Lyoto, but still, it definitely holds a lot of name value, and it was a good fight, and it was a good win for him. So I'm not necessarily pulling for him, but as far as his career is concerned, I am, and I hope he does well for sure, because I think he could be a really bright spot for Bellator. And if we move back, I guess, um, Saturday morning, mid-morning, whatever, um, you've got UFC on ESPN Plus 3, Blahovich and Santos and we had talked about this before we came on I think it's a really fun card there's a lot of good fights there maybe the name recognition isn't totally there for me it is personally there's a lot of fighters on this card that I want to see fight um if you're trying to sell this to one of your friends that caught uh, the Nganu Velasquez fights that wasn't really a big MMA fan it might be tough what do you think of this card overall well, I think that's a perfect analogy. If you're trying to sell it to someone who doesn't watch MMA, can you do it? I think that's a very good indicator of how good the card is on paper. Obviously, with name recognition and name values, superstars, pay-per-view, that obviously helps. But I think if you weren't going to have any of that, this would be the card to show people. You've got Tiago Santos and Jan Blahovic, two guys who are coming off unbelievably exciting wins against Jimmy Manoa. I mean, come on. Those were oh, yeah. incredible. Um, you've got Magomed Ankalaev, who... Katerov aside is an incredible prospect in the light heavyweight division. Petr Jan, John Dodson is going to be fireworks. Uh, Putilova's on the card. Uh, she's coming off one of the best fights in recent memory against Aldana. Um, there's so much on this card to be looking forward to. If you're hardcore, if you're a casual who happens to tune in, it might not have the name recognition, but it's got the fights. And for that, I'm giving it a B. I think that's totally fair. I'll, I'll go with a B, too. Um, I, I really like the fights. The The one thing that kind of weirds me out, and I, I actually wrote an article um, earlier on in the week about it, the fact that John Vellante is on the main card, and, I mean, he had a decent fight against Ed Herman in his last one. I was at that one. And, uh, I mean, it was half decent, but, like, I'm looking down, and the fact that Dodson and, and Jan, it's a second fight there, maybe move that one up a little bit. Get people really riled up for a decent co-main in Struve and Delima. I think that one's fun. Um, Delima looked good at heavyweight in his last fight. Struve, you never know what to expect with him. Um, has he found his range yet? I don't know. But I hope. that yeah, that remains to be seen because he was he was a talent. I mean, even before he beat um Stipe, like he he was a talent and somebody that people expected a lot out of him. But there's so many good fights. I mean, you brought it up. Um, the Ismagulov fight and Alvarez, that's a fun one. Two former champs. Um, Diego Fajaya looked great. In his last two fights, he's looked really good. And I know Kyle Nelson was on short notice at UFC 231, but still good. Kalibov, a lot of people think highly of Prezeris. I don't with the weight issues that he had at lightweight. It was really disappointing to me, but it, it should be a fun fight. Demir Hadzovic is a guy that I wish would kind of skyrocket at 155. I don't know if he will yet. He's one of those guys at a UFD, um, and they've got some really, really good fighters there uh, that train in Germany, and, and he's just one of them. Um, you got the Canadian Jillian Robertson. You've also got Daniel Tamor, the lesser Tamor, taking on Chris Fishgold in a second UFC fight. I mean, former Cage Warriors champ, he did not look good in Moncton against Calvin Cater. But yeah, we just keep going through this. It's a lot of fun fights. I think a B is fair. The last question I do have for you. So, Blahovich Santos, two good wins over Jimmy Manoa. Does a winner get a title shot? Oof, uh, that's tough. I think a lot of it depends on what happens with John Jones. Obviously, he's got 235 against Lionheart Smith. So, let's, for the sake of this argument, assume that he wins that fight. What's next? I think the winner of this fight is a shoe-in. Uh, I don't think there's anyone else at light heavyweight who can kind of best don't think the two Reyes of them Ustamir. in terms of a title shot. Not Ustamir mm -hmm. or Reyes. Mm -hmm. I think the winner of Blahovich Santos has a better case for the title than the winner of Uzdemir Reyes because I think that uh, Uzdemir's stock has been lowered with the loss to Lionheart. And while I applaud Lionheart, he's a fantastic fighter. You can't argue with what he's been able to do. Um, I don't think that's the kind of number one contender loss that you can afford if you're Uzdemir. And I recognize that might not be the most accepted position, so I'm fine with blowback. But if Reyes beats Uzdemir, I don't think that at this stage, with the loss to Smith, Uzdemir becomes the, you beat the contender, you become the contender. So I think that the Blahovich santos winner, especially because Santos has a win over Smith, 
uh, becomes the number one contender. And honestly, from a, a selfish perspective, I want Reyes to take as much time as he needs before he faces John Jones. I want him to build up. I, mean, I know you're in your head. <laughs> I think, realistically, if Jones wins... Now, there's two schools of thought. Jones cleans out the light heavyweight division, fights everybody, and then moves up. For me, I want to see him move up. I want to see him fight uh, DC at heavyweight this year. So that kind of gums it up. Make an interim title fight. I'm fine with that. And have Santos and Anthony Smith fight for the interim title. If Smith loses, I don't care. Make that an interim title. You've got a storyline there. They can both finish fights. That one's fun. Let Jones do his heavyweight thing. And then we just kind of regroup in 2020 because... If Blahovich wins, I, I'm not a guy, I don't really care too much about age, but he is 35, uh, he turns 36 in three days, so he's he's an older guy at light heavyweight, and if he wins, I don't give him much of a shot against, and if Smith's able to pull off an upset, I think Smith would beat him, and I don't think he has much of a shot against Jones. Um, I do really, really respect him as a fighter. I mean, if you can beat Manoa that way, and if you can beat Nikita Krylov, who's a guy that I held in really, really, I still do, but his last fight wasn't good, but I held him in really high regard. I picked Krylov to yeah. win. Um, so that's, yeah, it's it's just a weird, weird situation, but you're picking the winner of this fight to get a title shot. I'm picking the winner of this fight should get a title shot. I'm not saying they're going to get it. Michael Fidel on Fight Night Picks, the winner should get a title shot. Michael, Thanks so much for joining me. Um, new role with the body lock. So if you can explain that once more and where people can find you on social media. Absolutely. So you can find me on social media on Twitter at, at Michael Fidel, F-I-E-D-E-L. I have an Instagram, Michael Fidel MMA. I don't use it. <laughs> um, uh, that's basically it in terms of social media. But yeah, I'm exclusively with the body lock now. Great team over there. We're upping our content levels, pumping out everything that you need as a fight fan regional content, news, in-depth interviews and profiles, exclusives, opinions, breakdowns. Um, so I'm stepping up as a contributing editor, which essentially means that in addition to the pieces that I put out, I'm going to be working more in a column mindset, writing more uh, retrospectives and opinions on things that are unfolding in MMA, while also being able to help out with um, advising guys who are new to the site, people who are new to writing, and being able to impart the knowledge that I've been taught in such a short time uh, to them. Uh, and I think that's going to be great. So please check out at the Body Lock MMA on Twitter and thebodylockmma.com. Yeah, it's going to be great. Very best, Michael. Thanks so much for joining us again. And everyone Thank you. should definitely check out the Body Lock MMA. They're doing great work over there. And uh, I'm, I'm a big fan for sure. So thanks again. And we're back. So really want to thank Michael for coming back on the show. Great conversation as always. Um, kind of sucks too with Gordon Ryan being out for an extended out in that one too. Yeah, extended amount of time. It's going to be roughly a six month recovery, probably plus. I mean, not everybody's Tony Ferguson and can uh, respond to. It's an LCL injury for Gordon, but wishing him nothing but the best. It's kind of scary, like Michael said. Um, he's going to be sitting on the sidelines, but actually. Not participating with Don Herdesquad, but just sitting there and watching everything. Exactly. He's still going to benefit from sort of the time off. He'll still make improvements. Now, if he moves into MMA, let's say, because there's a chance he goes to one um, with Gary Tonin. There's a chance he ends up in, in a Bellator or another organization, a KSW. I want to see him in the UFC. They're so will throw a lot of money at him too, I think. If he slots into the UFC, realistically, what do you think the ceiling is on him? You don't really know yet because no one really knows what his striking looks like. Of course, if he gets anyone to the ground, except for maybe Verdum, uh, he's going to have a massive advantage over all of them. And, and it's even, funny that you bring up Verdum because they were supposed to have a jiu-jitsu exactly. match coming up, which unfortunately that, that could cancel. There's not many people with his level of jiu-jitsu in the world, much less in MMA. So Much less at 265. That's what I, Yeah, just in MMA in general, uh, not many people. I mean, there's Maya, Gary Tonin, but all those guys are in his weight class. Just his level of jiu-jitsu is off the charts. But uh, yeah, in the heavyweight division, uh, the only people who I think are going to give him real trouble is a guy like Stipe or Curtis Blades who have really good wrestling, but they don't use it offensively, yeah. just defensive. Because a guy like Stipe, you're going to go at him, you're going to try to take him down, and you're not going to be able to, and he's going to light you on fire on the feet. So I think if I was uh, Gordon Ryan, I wouldn't do anything in the striking department. I would just focus on my wrestling right now. Well, it's I kind of disagree just a bit with you, and we saw it with Gary Tone in the interview we had with Fight Night Picks. It's interesting because John Donaher actually does some of the oh, striking he's, yeah, coaching. He's a he's, great mastermind behind everything. It, I mean, exactly. he's Actually, St. Pierre throughout his whole career, not just with his grappling. I just think that anyone can get caught on the feet, but 
you can't just get caught in a rear naked choke. And if you're such a good grappler, why even risk it on the feet? And for a guy like Gordon Ryan too, and Michael brought it up and we talked about it uh, at length there about Crone Gracie and just how wonky his striking was. It it, it didn't look great. Didn't, no, relatively effective, I would it say. Did, but it, it was very Jake Shields esque in the fact that Jake Shields had a really successful career. His striking looks god awful. Because all his striking was is it was awkward and weird, but just helped him close the distance, get those takedowns. Like, really good grapplers, Danny and Maya. But his striking's kind of improved. It's slow as molasses, but still, like, yeah. his technique's not terrible. But a lot of these jiu-jitsu guys, their striking is only good enough to get them close to you just so they can take you down. Exactly. So I'm looking forward to, again, some more Chrome Gracie fights at 145. I think, uh, like Michael and I touched on, a Ryan Hall fight, I want to see it, but like at the that. same time, I don't want to see it because then you've got a loss on Crone's record. You want to kind you of build him up a little bit. Hall? It's a tough one. It's I a tough one it. between the two of them. I think it's very much like when Ed Ruth was bragging about doing well at ADCC and then he fought a real Gracie and you see, oh, ADCC's not shit when you're fighting the family that invented the sport. <sighs> Ryan Hall's pretty damn good. I, I, know, I just so I don't want to see I don't want to see that this early just yet. I mean, Ed Ruth, they built him up a little bit. Crone Gracie, let's build him up a bit. But moving forward this weekend, so we said it, UFC Prague, you've also got Bellator 217. So first of all, we'll get into Bellator. You can see the odds below. And if we look at them right now, let's go through, if we look main card, Richie Smullen is almost a over a four to one favorite in that fight. I'll be honest right now. I'm not super familiar with any of the fighters. I'll be honest. So don't take my picks as like, oh, let's put money on these people. No, I mean, realistically, we'll go over uh, the card kind of at a glance. Um, we're not going to be doing a fight companion for this one. We're going to be doing it for UFC Prague. So just to, just to live up to the fight night picks. Oh, name, yeah, of course. Just... Richie Smolin, Adam Gustav. Um, Smolin from The Ultimate Fighter Season 27. He made it to the finals. I was going to say, I do recognize on, Smolin. Yeah, he took on Luis Pena. Um, and it's kind of a tough one because Gustav, 3-3. Three and three, um, Kind of a, well, not really kind of. I fight Pena. Pena got hurt. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Either sure, way, right. he was in the Ultimate Fighter, though. Salty record here. Um, and, yeah, I mean, Gustav lot, losing his last two. We saw him back in November. He got finished. He got finished in the Stop. fight before that. So, I mean, not really the greatest record there. You can kind of justify the odds that way. Smalling with SBG, and if you're under 155, it's a pretty decent stable yeah, exactly. of fighters there. Jamie Stevenson taking on Irish Charlie Ward. Charlie Ward, and they tried to sell it today. Bellator did, and I knew they would. Yeah, and I the caught them McGregor on it. Thing. The whole McGregor thing. Um, that was Charlie Ward's last fight. He he did get the finish in that one, um, and you can build off of that. Ward, a, a heavy favorite. And realistically, I'm looking at this fight. I don't think Charlie Ward's very good. That's what I was going to say. I mean, Charlie Ward isn't all that great. I know he had that knockout, and I touched on it with Michael Fidel, the Glory Buffondo fight. <laughs> Jamie Stevenson. Um, it might be the funniest knockout I've ever seen. Jamie Stevenson lost two in a row in 2013-14, made his return to MMA in 2017. We haven't seen him since, um, geez, September 2017, but got a first-round finish there. Um, and he does have a loss to Kiefer Crosby a long time ago as an amateur. Crosby's also on this card at 5-0. and oh. So if I'm making a pick, I'm going to pick against Ward in this one. I know it's in Ireland. He's going to have that stable of SBG guys, but I've got Stevenson in, in this one. Charlie yeah. Ward's one of these guys who it's they're they try to do UFC tried to do it with Gunnar Nelson. They're like, oh, he should be a star because he's at SBG. Then Gunnar Nelson's kind of almost has this weird cult following because he's so much different than all the guys at SBG. But they're using the gym to almost boost Charlie Ward's name. But he's not a great fighter and he's not great on the mic. He's not really the most marketable guy, but it seems like they're trying to market him. Yeah, they're trying to market him, and the thing is, he got into MMA at a relatively late age. I'm going to look into it here just to make sure, because um, we got the card up in front of us. He is... doesn't say there. He, he's about 37 or 38 he's not years young, old, yeah. and he's 5-3. and three. Um, You know, yeah, they're trying to build off the name a little bit, and, uh, and for that reason, again, I'm going with Stevenson. The co-main event is actually pretty good because Peter Quelly and um, his opponent, it's Miles Price, they've got a bit of a beef going into this one. Quelly, 11-4-1, Price, 10-7. and seven. If you look at Miles Price, he actually has fought good competition. Lost to Norman Park earlier this year in Bama, or sorry, Brave. Um, Norman Park, former UFC yeah, fighter. He's, he's fighting at KSW 47 uh, coming up. They just announced that fight notice, this week. Yeah. yeah, short notice. There's bad blood in that fight too, so... I'm looking forward to that one. And KSW 47 will be all over it, but it's one 
hell Our of an effing card. Is fighting Narcoon. They keep adding to that card, man. Damien Yankowski just had a fight that was announced. He's former Olympian. Pudzinowski um, taking big, on Kalecki. How much bigger is DeFreeze than Narcoon? I was wondering that today. De- is it a big, big size difference or are they kind of even? I think it's going to be close. I do too. DeFreeze isn't a huge heavyweight. Like and He's Narcoon's like a 240 a guy. Narcoon's a big light heavyweight, um, so it should be it should be a decent fight. His last fights were, were catch weights, and they go by KGs there, so I think they weighed in at like 203 when he fought Kalibov the last two times. But he's a big guy. He, he like he was way bigger than Kalibov. He and Kalibov. it's going to be fun too because not to get sidetracked, but uh, Narcoon's going to have the advantage with striking, and DeFreeze is going to have the wrestling and grappling advantages. He's going to have the wrestling advantage. I don't know if jujitsu wise he will have a big advantage. If you remember, like Kalibov beat the brakes off Narcoon for the first two rounds of their fight, and then Narcoon off his back triangle trip Kalibov. Like he's very adept grappling. He is. It, it's going to be a really good fight. fight yeah. Exactly. We're going to have to. Sidetrack. Yeah, we're going to have to watch a lot more tape. But going back to the Miles Price. Peter Quelly fight. Peter Quelly trains out of SBG. That doesn't matter. The guy's a firecracker on his own. He's 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 even more so. Like he he really talks the talk. Um, fought with Fight Nights Global recently. He's fought some decent competition over his career. Um, had a first round finish back in May of last year. Miles Price. So I was saying fought Norman Park. Fought Kane Musa from ACB. Um, and he fought Norman Park again earlier on in his career. So he has fought some decent competition there. It's a half decent fight. I've got uh, Quelly winning it. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a sizable favorite. He's a sizable too. favorite. And then in the main event, the guy that everybody likes to hate on. And listen, again, all these guys are from SBG. I actually like James Gallagher. I, don't. I, I like to watch him. I like to watch him fight. Um, His gimmick, though, he tries too hard. He he tries hard, and the people of Reddit can't stand it. And that's really one of the like things that Michael and I touched on. Um, but if you look at this fight, they're kind of feeding him a guy that he's going to be able to get an easy win over. And Stephen Graham, a guy who's six and three. Um, he dropped his last two, if I'm not mistaken. I want to say the rule best. Oh, no. Oh, sorry. Jeez. Couldn't be wrong. Um, he lost. He, he went one and three to start his career. He's on a win streak. Um, won two in a row in 2018. But if you finishes. look at his topology page, he's the 26th ranked guy in Kansas. This was the point. Yeah, sorry. This is the point that I had. So to start the win streak, he beat a guy who was 2-16, and 16, then a 1-3, 4-5, and 3-0, and 9-14. and, oh and, nine and 14. Yeah, He hasn't really fought anybody. And James Gallagher has fought some decent names. Shinzo Machida. The last time he fought a good striker was Shinzo Machida. Well, he, Bundy has. At, yeah, well, the last time he got a win over a good striker was Machida. <laughs> Um, and then the Bandejas fight. That didn't go well. No, people like to make fun of it. In this fight, yeah, I'm taking Gallagher in this one. Yeah, they're kind. They're hoping he wins too. If he loses this, then we should be a little worried. But yeah, he's he not going and to. and it kind of sucks too. So he did make weight. He weighed in at 136. Um, he was booked to headline their last Ireland card, the one that uh, Charlie Ward had the the McGregor thing and all that. Um, and he had to pull out due to injury. He missed two fights before the Bandejas fight due to injury. He's so had a lot of injuries in his young career. He has. And that's the other thing. Very, very young. So Bellator 217 on the surface. Not really the cat's behind of cards. Not overly... I'll, I'll watch it. You'll see me tweeting about yeah. it. That's where you can find me. But UFC Prague. That's what we're focusing on. It's a good on. card, too. It's a good card. You'll be able to find us again on YouTube and on Sports Booth with the fight campaign. It starts at 11 a.m. Eastern here in North America. I will pull up the odds on that and get rid of the Prague uh, poster. So, there. it's a good one. On its head, and again, you're going to be late, so and you know the question that's coming. And Fidel oh, rank it. knew the question that was coming, and Nolan King on Around the Cage knew what I was going to say about these Almost cards. Almost like you do it all the time. If you could give this card a letter grade, I, personally, I'm going to give you mine. Night, I would say like a B, B plus. And that's what Michael said too, if you go back. So Michael, it was a B with him. It's a B with me. I think on its face, I mean, name value, it's not bad. It's not great, but it's not bad. Excitement wise though, there's a lot of fights that are probably going to deliver. There's a lot of fights that I think could deliver too. So if we go down through the card, the true fight night pick style, we look at some of these fights. We start off with Carlos Diego Fajaya taking on Rustam Kalibov. I picked this one as possibly being, it could be a fight of the night. I really do think that. Diego Fajaya is a pretty well-rounded fighter. He, he has finishing abilities. Rustam Kalibov, and we were talking about this before the show, has been in the UFC for a long time. He's like a store brand Khabib, but yeah. like not a good, like he's not Kirkland. He's like no name. Pretty much. Exactly. Yeah. So in this fight, Kalibov, slight favorite, kind of like a, mi- a minus 145, minus 155. I think those odds are fair. Yeah, I do too. Diego Fajaya has finished his last two opponents, Jared Gordon, and then Kyle Nelson on short notice, UFC 231. He, he did look good. I'm picking the underdog in this fight. I know Kalibov's on a win streak right now, but I, I like the the 
you know, wave momentum that Fahea has. Yeah. Plus, he missed weight. Lately, missing weight hasn't worked great for fighters. But, but it never has. If you look at the stats, they're pretty much 50-50 anyways. I never cheer for someone who misses weight except for this. I don't like Rooster Capulot very well. Um, I thought he lost his last fight against Cajun Johnson. I thought he yeah, lost so it. did I. Yeah, like yeah. Cajun beat him. And Cajun's not the best fighter in the world. So I think uh, Diego Fahea... I think he might drop him and then submit him. Because if you look at Ferreira, he's got really heavy hands. And a lot of people talk about his power. But he only has like two or three knockouts yeah. in his career. He's not... Because a lot of times you're one of these guys. He hurts you on the feet, gets you down, and then submits you. Uh, which is always a really good sign. So in the next fight, you've got two former champs. You've got Yoel Alvarez coming over from AFL. Lightweight champ over there in Spain. Then you've got Demir Ismagulov. He was the M1 Global champ. Man, he looked awesome in his last yeah, fight. Good. Sizable favorite in this one. He's gonna win. He's about a three to one favorite. I'm taking Demir Zmagulov, and that's just based on strength of schedule that he faced in exactly. M1. He he faced a lot of good fighters, a lot of great records. That's not a big knock on AFL friend of the show, Alan Murphy, uh, director of international communications for KSW, just joined AFL in the same capacity. So congrats to Alan. But yeah, I just, I don't see it from Alvarez. And a lot of these fighters, like you said, it's no fault of their own. It's just whatever organization that they had ended up joining kind of in their development stage. But you can't compare things like jungle fights to cage warriors. You know what I mean? Like there's just some leagues are stronger than others, especially for developmental ones. Yeah, I mean, if, if you look at his record, the last, I mean, 13-2, a good record. 16-10, and 10, not that great. Um, and, and for Alvarez, this is who we're speaking yeah. on. Um, I did look at this when I, when I did a piece. And if you go on to fightnightpicks.net, um, UFC's check debut, full of fun, uh, <laughs> full of fun fights. Words are tough. Tongue tied. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to this fight. I broke it down quite a bit, and if you look at Alvarez, 14 of 15 wins are by submission, which yeah. is awesome. I just think his Magulov, his wrestling's good, his stand up is really good, exactly. and his clinch game is good. So I don't think he's gonna fall into those traps from Alvarez, and that's why I've got him in this one. I could not agree more. In your next fight, it's a guy that I spoke with um, outside of the event with UFC Moncton was Chris Fishgold. <laughs> Tough fight for him. Man. Taking on Daniel Tamor. He's and in Fishgold's win. last one, yeah, against Calvin Cater. Calvin Cater is a guy that on any given day could beat a ranked opponent in the UFC. He is ranked. He's ranked 50. Exactly. Yeah, moving up the ladder. Um, Fishgold, former 145 champ with Cage Warriors, which holds water because... 155. 155, sorry. 155 and 145 in Cage Warriors are really, really good... Uh, couple of divisions that they have over there and he's taking on daniel tamor who's and not very good matt does not hold daniel tamor in I very don't. high i regard. think his brother's really good i don't like his brother's dirty but his brother is a really good fighter daniel he's just not great if you watch his fights they bill him as a grappler but i don't think i've ever seen him get a takedown he gets taken down a lot um his record's what six and three or six and two Six and two, yeah, six, six and two. two. And Taking on a guy seventeen two and one. That's a, a lot of experience. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Fishgold's gonna run away with this fight. He'll get the stoppage, I assume. Yeah, okay. I I think Fishgold's gonna be able to take it to the ground. And you talk the difference of grapplers. I mean, Chris Fishgold's a guy competing at Polaris. I know he lost against Martian Held, still, he's legit. but still, yeah, he is legit. And I've got Fishgold in this one. Your next one, Ishmael Naduriev taking on Michael Prezeris. It's on an eight-fight win streak that no one knows about. Prezeris, for me, is a guy, and I talked about it with uh, Michael Fidel. He's a guy that I don't hold in very high regard because he missed weight. 16 times. A number of times. And I, I know in the Desmond Green fight, there was extenuating circumstances. Uh, kind of forced him to move up. And and it's a good decision on his part. And and the guy's got a hell of a record, 26-2. Um, taking on a relative, I, I want to say unknown. I'm not overly familiar with who he's fighting. No, I mean, you're talking about Nadirev? The, uh, the Austrian wonder boy. The Austrian wonder boy. And, you know, you look at the losses. Um, one in 2014, the guy fights every other weekend. Oh my god, he does. One in 2017 on a two-fight win streak. Both of them first round finishes. Spinning wheel kick and punches, and then punches again. Prezeris... A, a good wrestler. Yeah, he's, he's a, really, a good really, really good wrestler. And if you look at the odds in this one, um, Prezeris, a 4-1 to one favorite in this. I, I'm going to go with Prezeris. He'll win by decision. And I think it's going to be a really, really tough... I think the UFC. next fight's going to be really good. Yeah, it's a tough UFC debut um, for the... What was it? The Austrian Wonder Boy. That's a... Uh, that's, that's nick- it's better than Anabolic Arab that we saw last week. That's, uh, that's... Yeah, that's a salty nickname. Next fight. Hell of a fight. Yeah. Demir Hadzovic, Marco Polo Reyes. Um, Hadzovic, just slight favorite. Odds are kind of closing in to Polo's power. Hadzovic 
you talk about fighters and it's funny it's not the fact that the bosnia herzegovina um kind of connection but i do think of these guys kind of in the same light mersad bektik and demir hadzovic demir hadzovic is the type of guy that he strikes he strikes he strikes and that's pretty much all you're going to get out of good at everything yeah, bektik's a lot better of a fighter but they do strike a lot they throw a lot of leg kicks that's what you're going to see out of a guy like hadzovic polo reyes is a really complete fighter and I'm going to take this, the kind of underdog. I mean, the, the, the odds are pretty close. much even. But I'm going to take Polo Reyes in this uh, one. So am I. I think he's going to catch Hadzovic, knock him out. I think so. First or second round. As well. The next fight on the card, and if you're going by the odds, you've got Carlo Petersoli taking on Dwight Grant. Petersoli was a guy, came over from Cage Warriors, and then he took, what was it? It was a short notice fight. He won a split decision against somebody in his uh, first fight. I just know in his second fight, he kind of he took a short notice fight against Brazilian Cowboy. And that's a terrible idea. Did not go well for him. Brad so Scott, if, that's what Yeah, if you go back through and you look at Petter Soli, he had the split decision win over Nicholas Dalby, where if you look at Petter Soli, he, he's kind of reminiscent of a Holly Holm, where he'll throw like a one, two, three high kick. That's his thing. You're going to see that over and over and over again. Um, and that's what he did against Dalby, one, two, three. And then it's it, it's a lightning quick high it's kick. Good, exactly. It's got some power behind it, and that's kind of how he was able to force the judges with the Dalby split. But then if you look at the Cowboy fight, he tried that exact same thing. Cowboy just caught the kick and then hit him yeah, with a big right. I mean, Cowboy knew what was coming. For Dwight Grant, a good fighter. He had the win. Um, I thought he beat Zach Otto. Yeah, he had the win at Contender Series Season 2 um, over Tyler Hill, who was a good opponent. If you look at all the guys that he's fought, all good records except for his third fight in 2011. So that doesn't really hold a lot of water. Zach Otto's not a great guy to lose to, though. But Dwight, yeah, Zach Otto's not a great guy to lose to. And Zach Otto's a wrestler, and he lost to him on the feet, which is kind of a shame. It was a terrible fight. It was gar- like it was awful. Yeah, back in Both Milwaukee. Both guys gas in the first round. And and from Grant, you're going to see more of that striking. So, yeah, I've got Petter Soli in Sit this away. fight. Um, and if you can pick them up at a minus 150, if you're into that sort Not of Not a terrible thing. idea. I put together a parlay today that wasn't terrible. It was like a plus 800. I think it was... Here, we'll get to it at the end anyway. Yeah, we'll get to it. Um, next fight, Veronica Macedo taking on the Canadian Jillian Robertson. It's it's kind of a tough one. It's it's a it's a good fight. Um, I like the way that they've they put this one together. It's not a fight that's gonna grab headlines at one twenty five. No, no. Macedo five two with the one uh, draw, and Robertson five and three lost her last fight. Um, and I believe by yeah, it was by submission. <sighs> I mean, she's only really lost to, to good or decent fighters. The last one was against uh, five and zero oh, Myra Buena Silva. Um, and Macedo, I mean, hit or miss. I don't think either of these two are going to make waves at 125. No. So it, it's not going to, again, it's not going to grab the headlines. I wouldn't bet on this fight. No, I wouldn't either. If you were going to make a pick, though, Robertson or Macedo, who Always are you pick take? the over in women's MMA when you don't know who's going to win. So Veronica Macedo. Macedo it is in your next fight. Magomed Ankalaev taking on Kittleson Freyas, uh, De Abreu. Magomed going to win this. Yeah, you've got Magomed in this one. Um, I mean, yeah, he's 10 and one Kittleson, um, 14 and two, um, former champ over and brave making his UFC debut, fought some decent competition over his career, um, fought an MCOV that wasn't Vadim. And in his last fight, uh, this does not, yeah, he took, took on Anton Viazijan, um, who's a heavyweight. Um, and they fought at, I just want to make sure. Yeah, they fought at heavyweight. So he did fight at heavyweight in his last one because that's funny, Anton Vizijin's a name that comes up all the time when we're talking about um, Sergei Hartanov. But if we're looking at this fight, Ankalaev, um, yeah, that's that's who I'm picking in this one too. It's it's a tough um, out in your UFC debut. And I'm surprised the odds are actually this close, but a 2-1 to one favorite for Ankalaev. Next fight, possibly fight of the night, do you think? It's either fight of the night or the worst fight of the night. Jo- there's two John Dodsons. There's knockout John Dodson, who's super fun to watch and he's great. And then there's like try to point fight John Dodson, but he's not great at it. Uh, which John Dodson are we going to see? We're going to see the point fighting one. I think he's going to win a boring decision. And it pains me to say that because I like Petra Jan. And I want to see him like finish John Dodson because I think Jan... I want to see Jan versus Lineker really bad. Yeah, I want to see Jan just build and build exactly. and build. But I think John Dodson... He's by far the best guy Jan's ever fought. And, you know, realistically, I mean, this is a hell of a matchup it's on really paper. Good. Both guys, kind of similar style. Lots of power, quick hands from if, the two of them. If Dodson stands and tries to trade with Jan, he's going to get caught and he's going to get knocked out. 
But if Dodson fights really smart, I do think his footwork is going to be enough to uh, win a boring decision. There's a lot more miles on a guy like John Dodson than some of the guys that Jan has faced in the past. Um, Douglas Andrade is one of those guys. I mean, a great win there. You look at Jinsu Sun. That I was mean, a great fight. That... Jinsu Sun's not a phenomenal fighter, really. Who knows? Maybe he is. Yeah. And then Teruto Ishihara is not good. Not anymore. He has not anymore. For a while. Most people pick on him for his looks more than anything at this I just, point. I want. I'm cheering for Petrion, but I think John Dodson's going to win a boring decision. I hope not, but I do think that's how it's going to go. I'm picking on uh, minus three hundred. You see where I'm coming there. from, though. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Um, I've got it as a possible fight tonight. For me, my pick is Diego Fajaya Calabar, but I this is a fans. close. This is a close second. In the next one, you've got the sole fighter from the Czech Republic. You've got Lucy Putalova taking on Liz Carmouche. This is a fight where you've got somebody who's fought for a title before in Liz Carmouche who physically looks like she works out five times a day. I don't know why the odds are so close. I don't either. I, like I it's, Put money on Liz Carmouche. I'll tell you that right now. The odds are almost even and she's way better at everything. Yeah, like Liz Carmouche, 12 and 6. She's only ever really fought top competition in her career. That one loss, like I said, um, was against Ron Rousey for the title. It was an iron bar, big whoop. Um, went over Andrade, losses to Alexis Davis, Misha Tate. And Alexis Davis again, and that was a split. I mean, she, she only... looked really good against Jennifer Maya, though, in her last fight. And I just think that... Uh, yeah, she, Pudel... looked, she looked really good she against gets... Jennifer Maya. And uh, Pudelova, she's good on the feet. Like, she throws... She punches really hard, but she gets tired. She doesn't cut off the cage very well. She follows. That's her problem. That's what she did against uh, Irina Aldana. She just kept on following her. She wouldn't cut the cage off. And uh, I don't really know what her ground game looks like, if I'm being completely honest. But I know that Liz Carmouche has a phenomenal ground game. So I think Carmouche is eventually going to get her down and TKO or submission due to ground pin. Yeah, and I mean, you look at kind of those grudge match uh, type fights that she had against Lena Landsberg. And if if she got beat by Lena Landsberg twice, I think that, yeah, Carmouche is going to have the, the advantage there. Plus, she's coming off the loss to Aldana. And it was a great look, fight, to be fair. That was a really good fight. You look at the wins, too. I mean, a win over Sarah Morris, a win over Gian Kim. Um, both kind of strikers too. Carmouche yeah. is a lot more well-rounded than that. Her wrestling's great. Her striking's really good too. So yeah, that's why I'm picking Carmouche. And she's a minus like 130 all the way to like a minus 150. Yeah, Definitely sure. a good pick if you're throwing some picks together. Your next fight is one that I'm surprised on this main card. Um, I would think that Jan and Dodson would be higher. There's a lot of fighters, like even as Magulov and, and Alvarez you could put up. But you've got Jean Volante who... I mean, in his last fight against Ed Herman, tons of volume. If you think I don't hold Rustin Cavula in very high regard, or Daniel Tamer, <laughs> you wait till I start talking about Jean Volante. And Matt's probably going to be here when I replay um, one of the Jean Volante interviews during I'm the show. I'm sure he's a great guy, and he seems like a good guy, and he seems fun. And I'm sure I'd want to party with him. But his fighting style is not very fun to watch. He gasses. He's got a good chin, and he hits hard, which are two very good things. But he gasses. He's not very technical. I say he hits hard, but he's not like, you know, he's not like he got knocked out by Shogun. Yeah. He just, I don't think he's all that good. And you're looking at the guy that he's fighting um, out of Poland. Lord is always a great nickname. If you like, uh, I can't think of Lord songs, but uh, Michael Alexijuk, that's it. Um, he had the no contest against Khalil Roundtree in his last one. Failed that drug test. Yeah, failed that drug test. Um, in this one. You know, you got to go Lord over Volante, I would think. Oh, yeah. He's, he's going to wrestle him. He's going to wrestle him. Tire him out, knock him out in the third round. Yeah, that's pretty that's much. pretty much it. John Volante is not known as a cardio king. And one of the things that I'm going to make an emphasis on tomorrow, spoiler alert, is will we see John Volante with a loss here, maybe move up to heavyweight? It's something that he talked about after his last fight. I think it'd be a decent one. He's a company he's man is the only thing. I know he's friends with Dana White and he's friends with Chris Weidman and Stipe and they're big stars. I don't know how much longer you can keep him. Yeah. You can, like, Artem Lobov's gone and he's best friends with Conor McGregor. Eventually, everyone gets cut no matter how bad you are. Choo-choo, motherfuckers. And Eventually. I, like, yeah. okay, can we look at Jean Vellante's last few fights? I know he beat Ed Herman. He didn't beat Ed Herman. That fight was awful, too. It wasn't a good fight. I had Ed Herman. Then he lost to Sam Alvey by split. Fight. Beat Barroso by fight. split. He won that fight. I know, easy. but it wasn't good. I'm just speaking of, like, do fans really want to watch Jean Vellante fight? Not really. The Saverbeck Safarov fight was good, but Saverbeck Safarov is not a good fighter. He beat. He got knocked out by Tom Lawler. That Tom Lawler fight was fun as hell. It was. 
if you want, if you go back and watch it, Volante won the first round easy, like easy, easy, yeah. easy. And then in the second round, Lawler kind of comes in and goes wonky and throws an uppercut and knocks Volante right out. It's, it's a pretty fun just, fight if you want to go back and watch it because I, I was a pretty big Tom Lawler fan. And then uh, Duran Wynn kind of came in and took the wind out of those sails. But uh, Jean Vellante is all heart, but he just doesn't have the skill to match. That's the only problem. I don't see him winning this fight. I see him losing. Maybe he goes up to heavyweight and they give him one fight at heavyweight. But if he loses this and then another yeah. one, I don't know how much longer Jean Vellante is going to be in the UFC. Great guy, but it only takes you so far when exactly. you're fighting and it's based on performance. And like, that that brings up the next fighter really on the card. Stefan Struve and Marcus Ruggiero de Lima. Oh boy. So Stefan Struve's been in the UFC forever. 17 years. Forever. And he's a slight favorite. The odds are pretty much par on this one. I understand why he's a slight favorite, even though he's on a losing streak. Yeah, I mean, you could flip a coin and make your pick, and it's a beaver on her her, uh, nickels. Have we mentioned we're Canadian? Yeah, exactly. But in in this case, I mean, Ruggiero de Lima made the move up in his last fight to 265. Fought a he had fought there before, though. Yeah, he's making the move back up. Um, he had a lost OSP by Von Flew. Then he came back and took on Adam Vicerec. He got the win there. He actually looked pretty good um, that in that one. But realistically, Ruggiero de Lima, you got to watch out for the kicks. You do. He's he's thick, thick. He's a thick boy. He's a real thick boy. And he throws, yeah, he throws really heavy kicks. He does. He will tire. And his hands are pretty decent. If you look at Stefan Struve, I mean... This is an honest question. Can he reach Stefan Struve? Four, three rounds. Because if you look at the way in, Struve is... And I know, like, Struve's taller than everybody. Seven but feet it's, tall. I know he's seven <laughs> feet tall. But, like, when he fights... A lot of heavyweights are, what, six three, six five. So, there's, yeah. he always has a height advantage, but it's never... I don't know. You know what I mean? It never plays a massive, massive factor into his fights because he doesn't know how to fight tall. No, I mean, think back, and this is a long while. Boy can't throw a jab. Put as much stock as you wanted to it. Think back to the Roy Nelson fight. Like think he back had to the steepest. so much reach on Roy Nelson. All Roy Nelson had to do was punch up, and he knocked him out. And Stefan Struve's weird because even in his losses, in some fights he's looked really good. If you remember, go back and watch that whole Mark fight, uh, the Mark Hunt fight. It was fight of the night. It yep. was really good. He yep. was busting Hunt up. Because if Struve, he needs to get into a rhythm, though. If he can jab, jab and uppercuts are his two best things. If he can just jab, uppercut, move, jab, uppercut, move. And he has good submissions, too, that no one really talks about because he's just so long and lanky. I think if he can get the fight to the floor, he should win. He has a big advantage in the grappling. I just don't know if he's able to, if his heart's still in it. you got to wonder about his health issues. There's just so many questions around Stefan Struve nowadays. The only two things I have on that is Ruggiero de Lima's last fight was against Vixarek, who has a really good ground game. He had the Oma Plata win yeah. over Arjan Singh Buller, and that was awesome. So if Struve can use his length, which everybody's been saying that forever, and he's on a three-fight losing streak, we'll see what happens. The other thing that's worth noting uh, didn't spend like any time with Hard Knocks 365 for this camp. Not a good sign. Which is not a good sign because they have a stable from 185 up that's really, really good. Like, so it's it's tough. The perfect guy to train for Marcus Ruggiero de Lima would be uh, Vulcan. They're pretty much the and same Vulcan, build and they Vulcan, do everything the same. Vulcan hasn't been in camp and in Florida for a while. He's I'm, been hanging out in Switzerland since the, the Smith loss and he's coming back. But a guy like Steve Mowry too, he'd be a good exactly. guy to use. There's a... Uh, there's a whole bunch of people who could help him there. Luke Rockhold, I know he's at AKA so, right now, but still, like, there's so many good guys at 365. Like, oh, I, it's tough. Seven Struve frustrates me because he should be so good. He has all the physical aspects. He's big. Kind of like, kind of like an Eric Silva. He's kinda still like a prospect. Silva, but like Struve, he has good. If he fought just kickboxing, he'd probably be okay. If he just grappled, he'd probably be okay. He just can't put everything together. He doesn't have. He's very tough, and he's got a huge heart, but his chin's not phenomenal. He He's just not great at anything. And, God, I'm bragging on Stefan yeah, like I actually really like him. He's not. He's good at things. He's not great at anything, exactly. which is kind of tough when you're trying to make a name and make waves at 265, and you've been in the division for a really long time. He's just... It's tough. He's one of those 10 to 15 guys that's kind of going to be stuck if, in that spot. If you're not in the top 15 at heavyweight after 10 fights, it's probably not for you. The Heavyweight's not a deep weight class guys like andre he lost to andre arlovsky boxing arlovsky but yeah if we but still like he i think if struve loses it's done for him okay now let's move into a fight that actually holds potential title implications why is santos an underdog in the main event 
you've got two really good fighters, Jan Blahovich taking on Tiago Santos, both guys near the top of the division, both guys with great wins, like Michael Fidel said, over Jimmy Manoa. Blahovich in his last fight, it was the win over Nikita Krylov, which surprised the hell out of me. I don't know how I, to put a lot of stock in that, though. I had Krylov as winning that one since he left, even leaving the UFC, I think he left on a win. And no, if he, he did. No, he, beat, he lost the circuit off. He it was a down. loss, and then it was a, a few wins in Fight Nights Global before he came back. But if you look at who he won, he beat like Fabio Maldonado. Hey, Fabio was good at one Fabio point. Fabio was 63 years He's old. He's good at one point. But Blahovich uh, yeah, and Santos, was. odds are closing into par right now. Santos kind of gaining. Santos was a big favorite. The the question in this one, and it's a question that Michael addressed, is a question that I've seen on Twitter. Does the winner of this fight get a title shot? I think if Santos wins, he does. I don't think if Blahovich does. And it's unfortunate. I just think people still remember the Santos knockout of Anthony Smith. Who's fighting for the title next week? Anthony Smith. And for Blahovich, he turns 36 in the next couple of days. I talked about that with Michael. He's a guy that, I mean, this is probably the last Six shot. people know who Jan Blahovich is, though. The last the other problem. shot at a, at a title at uh, 205 in the UFC. Former KSW light heavyweight champ, and we know how good of a division they have you gotta there. got to get the fight to the ground, though, if he wants to win this. Got to get the fight to the ground. Um, and he's not even a phenomenal... Like, he's a really good grappler, but I'd say he's a kick... Like, he's a stand-up fighter first, but... It's uh, the best example I can use is when Junior Dos Santos fought Mark Hunt, just because it comes to mind. Junior Dos Santos can do everything, but he prefers to strike. That's kind of what you have to look at Jan Blahovich. He can do everything, but he prefers to strike. Tiago Santos, his grappling's okay, but he's like out of 10, his striking's a 15. Yeah, like his striking and his power is super good. And he has surprisingly good cardio. His cardio is not bad, is what I was going to say, because if you go back and watch that Kevin Holland fight, he pounded the fuck out of For Kevin 15 Holland. 15 minutes! Pounded. The fuck. We love him. Kevin Holland too because <laughs> he has the best chin in the world. Yeah, but Tiago Santos went after him, wrestled them like they were talking the whole fight. It was a fun fight it to was. watch. That was UFC 227. And Santos at 205 has a way better chin than he did at 185. Exactly. He doesn't have to cut and dehydrate, and you're not going to see like a David Branch type of fight in this one. So it's going to be a good one, but Blahovich does a lot of different things better than Santos. In this fight, it's a really tough one because with my head and my heart, I want to pick Santos. I think he wins. Too. I mean, if he doesn't win by a knockout, I mean, the only decision when he's had in recent memory is the Holland win. But, but I just, if you look at, uh, not to interrupt you, but like when Blahovich, he recently lost to uh, Patrick Cummings, like not that long ago. And I don't want to rag on Patrick Cummings, but hey, he's not great. So... It just, and what happened in that fight was he dropped Cummings, I want to say, twice in the first round, got tired, and then just couldn't yeah. really do a lot for the rest of the fight. I think if you're Santos, you got to go to the body. He did that really well against Jimmy Manuel. Every time they'd clinch up, Santos just hammers knees to the body, and it really hurts your And if, if this turns into a kickboxing fight, oh, you're, I'm picking Santos all yeah. day. If I'd it pick goes, Santos against John Jones if it turns into a kickboxing fight. If it goes to the ground, I'd be a little suspect and probably go with Blahovich. Oh, yeah. But if I'm making a pick right now and I'll go back through them tomorrow with the fight companion, I'm going to pick Santos to win the main so event. Much. Hopefully he gets a title shot. If Anthony Smith wins, Smith move, or Smith. If, if Smith wins, Jones should move up. If Jones wins, Jones should well, move up. Well, Smith wins, and John Jones gets an instant rematch. Yeah, I, I want Jones to move up. Recently, I see the conversation on Twitter is the fact that John Jones is going to stick around and fight more and more and I'd more. I'd be okay with that. So, I, hopefully Santos gets a shot there. But, overall, we're giving the card a B. We're really looking forward to it. You can find the Fight Companion on YouTube and Sports Booth. Again, I want to thank our guest, Hell of an interview with Phil Baroni. Looking forward to being active in 2019. Another guy looking forward to being active, but that's behind the keyboards. Michael Fidel, contributing editor. Maybe Michael Fidel could be next for Phil Baroni. Who with knows? With the body lock MMA. Michael, maybe call him out. Um, Jared Gordon wants a fight. Maybe Phil wants I Jared think he wants Gordon. A, what is it, a grappling match or something? Grappling match. Yeah, it could be kind of similar to Gary Tonin and uh, one man who fought in the UFC and Jake Shields doesn't like one heck of a lot. Um... What are you t- You just spoke in riddles for the last 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> Craig turned into uh, Rumpelstiltskin for a second. <laughs> Paul Harris. Crucemeyer Paul Harris. Um, different size advantage there, but a Gordon, uh, <laughs> a Gordon grappling match against Phil Baroni would be fun. A choo cha He fought in the UFC. Again, you can find me on Twitter at Craig Allen FMP. I'm also on Twitter. There's no riddles there. there Matt's a, on Twitter. There's a few riddles. But at not Matt many. Allen FMP. And a reminder, if you're really into a podcast, which I know I am, I listen to them all the time, there's an audio podcast version of this show. You can find it on iTunes, Stitcher, CastBox, and all the other podcatchers. So just type that in there. You'll see the logo. And this episode will be up there as well. So special thanks to our guest, Matt. Thanks for joining no me. Problem. We'll see you 
at some point tomorrow. I'll be here during, tomorrow at some point during the main card. And uh, be sure to follow along on Twitter and Instagram for more news and, and breaking stuff. But we'll be back again tomorrow on YouTube and Sports Booth.